Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and in this episode, we continue an exploration of the philosophy of Cicero by turning to his great work, Diophagius, better known by its English translations as On Obligations or On Duties. Cicero, perhaps the most famous of the Roman philosophers, wrote an influential treatise on duties and obligations in political life, which was subsequently published after his death. Diophagius, along with his Republic and Laws, serve as Cicero's long-standing political legacy to the West. In fact, on obligations was widely influential, and it also influenced the likes of St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, becoming an integral part of the development of Catholic deontological ethics, and was widely praised by many figures during the Enlightenment era, including Hugo Grotius, Voltaire, and Frederick the Great, to name a few. It was also mandated reading in England during the 17th century, before the rise of the likes of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. But what does the book entail? On Obligations is, in many ways, the conclusion of Cicero's unofficial three-volume work in political philosophy, if you tie his Republic laws and On Obligations together as a complete treatise of Cicero's political thoughts. There are themes that connect all three works, man's essential political or social nature, the importance of love of the fatherland, patriotism, and why man is fulfilled being in community, or perhaps more properly, properly, why it is that man has to be in a community in order to be fulfilled, the role of reason in differentiating man from beast, as well as our relationship to the moral law that brings men together in fellowship under the commonwealth. Like his Republic before this work, Cicero also attacks the Epicureans, the atheists, and others whom he deems a threat to commonwealth living. He also synthesizes Plato and Aristotle into a Romanized Stoic philosophy that Cicero is the father of. Cicero agrees with Aristotle that man is essentially political in nature. He naturally forms communities to find fellowship, belonging, and fulfillment. While the hint at duty was highlighted in some sections of Book I of the Republic, this work more explicitly deals with the importance of duties and obligations which were implied in the Republic. It is important to remember that Cicero sees patriotism, love of one's land or country, as a natural and important extension of our political animus. That patriotism is what binds a diverse multitude of people together for Cicero also agrees with Aristotle that political community is made of a multitude of differences that need to be united to have a common good or cause is one of the hallmarks of Ciceronian thought. This is an important feature then of Cicero's on obligations. Man needs to direct his faculties and energies to something, probably something productive rather than destructive. Therefore, man has been endowed with reason, which separates him from the beasts and the other animals of the field. Failure to utilize reason, or direct reason upward to something, makes man essentially like a beast. As Cicero says, between man and beast, there is this crucial difference. The beast, under sense impulses, applies itself only to what lies immediately before it, with quite minimal awareness of past and future. Whereas man is endowed with reason, which enables him to visualize consequences and detect the cause of things. It is important to remember that Cicero, like Aristotle before him, believes that men who reject their reasoning capacities will become like the worst of animals. People who merely follow their sensual appetites are like animalistic beasts. And human society degrades and becomes a savage and animalistic-like society as a result. Cicero's extolment of reason leads him to say that every aspect of our lives is touched 
and imbued with duties and obligations that we understand through the use of our reason. It is by having a tranquil and satisfied life in discharging one duties that brings people together in fellowship, friendship, and community. There is no aspect of public life or even private life which cannot be without its obligations, Cicero says. One has obligations to oneself, one has obligations to a family, one has obligations to his community, one has obligations to his religion, one has obligations to his country. This is what it means to be in a community and what the social animus drives us toward. For we were all in it together. There is no being out for oneself in a social reality. No one is truly only interested in their own cause when living in a commonwealth, a city, a community, a member of a religion, or part of a country. We would descend into being animals if that is how we lived our lives. For example, in a commonwealth, I may be a farmer. There is also a chairmaker or some sort of construction builder. There is also a lawmaker or political overseers. This harkens back to the farm manager analogy Cicero uses at the end of the Republic. We are all in community together because we all benefit one another and bring out the best in each other in a community. If I fail at my responsibilities or obligations as a farmer, the rest of the community will also suffer. If the construction builder reneges on his obligations or cuts corners to save time and money, disaster can strike and we would all suffer from that. If political overseers do not discharge their responsibilities of maintaining law and order, we can all suffer. But if I do my duty as a farmer, not only am I fulfilled as a farmer, but others benefit from my dutiful work as well. This goes for the same in any job, any employment, by anyone who has work and is a member of a community. By discharging their duties to whatever particular vocation they are engaged in, not only are they exceptional and fulfilled in that vocational life, we also experience positive benefits from their success. No one's success is purely their own. Cicero argues that there are two types of injustice, and these two types of injustice are sure to wrinkle the feathers of certain moderns who think that justice is just a form of activism and change. The first injustice is one that everyone is probably familiar with, bodily harm and failing to help others who have the power to do so. Continuing, the second form of injustice Cicero makes the startling claim that we that will undoubtedly strike at the heart of modern atomistic individualism. For he says that you who claim to be minding their own business, seemingly not harming anyone, such people refrain from the first type of injustice, which was bodily harm, but they are guilty of the second type of injustice by becoming deserters from the life of the community, for they contribute none of their pursuits efforts or skills to the commonwealth. That's why we brought in the earlier discussion of farmers, construction builders, and political overseers. No one is truly out only for themselves or minding their own business. If you were, you would detach yourself from the commonwealth and you wouldn't be engaged in any duties from which other members of the community benefit. Part of Cicero's deontological ethics is followed by is a result of his teleology of man's social animus. Famously, Immanuel Kant followed Cicero in this regard. Unsurprisingly, since Cicero's on obligations was mandated teaching during the age of Frederick the Great, of which Kant was familiar with as he was about to become famous with his ethics and metaphysics in the 1790s. Would we want to live in a commonwealth where everyone reneged on their obligations to each other? What kind of commonwealth would that be? It wouldn't be a commonwealth at all. 
What if everyone ignored helping someone who was being attacked by another because it's none of my business? What would come of society if everyone cut corners in their jobs and produced poor products for each other? What would come of society if people altogether reneged on their obligations to each other and said everything he produced was only for himself? Society, of course, would collapse. Man's social animus, his social nature, which brings him into community, which is part of man's intrinsic nature, his teleology, what it aims for, is ultimately conducive, therefore, to moral law and ethics by coming into a community, by embracing our telos of our social nature, and by discharging the duties we have in whatever vocation we find ourselves in, and in whatever community we are a member of, we build the healthy commonwealth together. We therefore live in a just society, one in which we do not inflict bodily harm on others, and one in which we are not just minding our own business. Cicero also argues that our obligations to friends and family are the first block of obligations we come into the world with, and they are ultimately the first block of patriotism. Cicero argues that men are in fellowship with each other universally because of our social nature. But if we follow human nature to its building blocks, its origins, we will ultimately arrive at the original starting point of our social animus, the love of friends and family above all other things. This is the basis of the close community which makes patriotism possible, and the city and the commonwealth which grows out of it. There is more than one level of human fellowship. Setting aside that shared, that we are shared, that humanity has a shared human nature, the closer link that we have is with particular peoples, a race, nation, language, perhaps even a religion. Within this group lies the closer union of those who form city-states for such citizens who share many things in common, city center, shrine, colonnades, streets, laws, rights, courts, voting privileges, beyond these the circle of acquaintances and close friends, and the many who have connections with each other in public affairs, business, and life. Closer still are the social bonds formed by kinship and kindred. Thus, we start from the unrestricted fellowship of the whole of human nature, and when we begin analyzing it as Cicero, Cicero does, we can begin to pinpoint how the commonwealth came into being. It begins with the family. It extends to our friends and acquaintances, those who live near us. We realize that these people are those who are like us. We speak a similar language. We worship the same God. We have, we come from the same origins. We share a similar history. And from that, everything else springs. So ultimately for Cicero, without family, there is no order. Without family, there are no deep bonds and intimate attachments within the personal life we have with others. Without this order and intimacy that begins in the family, there can ultimately be no city, and without the city, no state, and without the state, no laws. This is because when one has order in family and the intimacy that one has with family, one recognizes and grows in intimacy to a person, a living being whom we have attachments to. And by having those attachments, we have duties to them. This allows us to bracket out to intimacy and, uh, and love and the love of others, namely the love of community and those around us, which extends out of the family. This helps to build order in the community, which permits the rise of trust, which is essential, essential to the orderly state. Cicero later says that there is another penultimate bond, enduring friendship. All of this reflects our social animus and, want, and the want to honor others, especially family and friends, which will eventually lead to the commonwealth, to political societies. Cicero therefore continues to argue that once you realize the intimacy and obligation one has to family and friends, you realize that we have obligations to our community. And when you realize this, 
we have duties and obligations to our country, as he says. But once you have surveyed this entire scene with reason and close attention, none of these affinities has more weight and induces more affection than the allegiance we have to our state. Our parents are dear to us, and so are our children and relatives and friends. But our native land alone subsumes all the affections which we entertain. What good man would hesitate to face death on her behalf if it would be of service to her? So the barbaric conduct of these contemporary of ours, who have torn our land asunder with criminal act, engaged they have and have been in its utter destruction all the more heinous. So as we can see, Cicero's understanding of the teleological nature of the commonwealth and the state is that it grows out of our love and attachment and duties to family, which grows to friends, which grows to the town we live in, to the region that our town is in, and ultimately to the state which makes our lives possible. Here, Cicero is arguing that if you love your family, friends, and neighbors, you will be forced to realize through reason that common bond that allowed all of this to be made possible, the life we enjoy and the love we share, our country. Patriotism, after all, is love of the fatherland, love of the land that has allowed you to be born because it provided for your parents. It is the land that is much your, as much your mother and father as your biological mother and father. It is, and if this land were to be destroyed, then your family were to be destroyed. Therefore, just as you love your family, you love your country, and you will defend it. You will also remember that Cicero is writing and living in the time of the Roman civil wars, when people were out for themselves, for glory, for lust, for power, and they lost attachments to their fellow countrymen, Religion was in decline. You can see then that Cicero is also making comments about the nature of the Caesarian civil wars and the decline of the Republic. We have lost our love of our fellow man, our fellow citizens, our families. Brothers are murdering brothers. Sons are murdering fathers. Fathers are banishing their sons. No society can live in which that kind of social conflict emerges. If you have duties to your family, your friends, and your community, you will realize that you have a duty, therefore, to your country, too. Winston Churchill, for instance, was a famous Ciceronian, and you can hear overtures in his famous speech to the British people after the Battle of France. Churchill was also an avid reader of Cicero, and you can probably hear now the Ciceronian echoes in his speech. What General Vagon called the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties. You will also probably hear Ciceronian rhetoric and echoes in Horatian, Horatio Nelson's famous phrase, the Battle of Trafalgar, that England expects every man to do his duties. Furthermore, what Cicero says will again probably wrinkle moderns. Love of family and those who are like us is very natural. We love our family and we love those who are similar to us, people we know, we understand, who share our values. In fact, those who think that this is unnatural are guilty of the worst folly and ignorance. Such people will bring about the dissolution and the destruction of everything our ancestors had worked, ancestors had worked together to pass on to posterity. What Cicero is saying is that fellowship and community is natural to all persons, but then it becomes particular to the land, the country, the native language, the religious the religious community that we come from. Therefore, we can see how universal human nature is social. All people are brought into communities, but we can also see how human nature is particular. We develop particular bonds, particular duties, particular obligations to those who are like us, to our family, to our friends, to our local communities, 
to our church, to our city, and to our country. Another aspect of Cicero's On Obligations is that man's social animus needs direction. This returns us to what Cicero said at the beginning of his work about man being man, utilizing his reason, or becoming a beast, becoming dominated only by immediate sensation and sensual wants. Man's social animus, when directed only to himself, leads him to live a life like a beast. Man's social animus, when directed to the commonwealth, the common good, and the city, leads to productivity and health to oneself, but also to one's family, friends, and city. Cicero says, perhaps counterintuitively at first, that demagogues and those eager for power, as well as those eager for leisure, share something in common. They put their own interests above that of the commonwealth. Those who only want power are all about themselves, and those who are eager for leisure are also only about themselves. Cicero says, this is not wholly contemptible. We all want to enjoy some degree of leisure, and we all seek to have some degree of power. But never should this become the entire focus of our lives and energies, for this would just turn us into decadent animals. Leisure or self-interest must always have a tie to public duty. This is what the social animus aims for with the project of the city, as well as the idea of philanthropy. The city cannot come into being without a multitude of people working together for, some, for something and sharing their fruits with each other for something. The construction, well-being, and preservation of their society. It is their construction. It is theirs to take pride in. It is theirs to preserve and to pass on to their progeny. In other words, the duties we have to each other are enduring in that these duties we have to each other in present living honor the duties of those who have come before us, and we pass on those duties to those who are coming after us, the next generation, to continue this great project of building a society into the future. This endeavor of construction gives greater meaning and purpose to our lives. We honor the past, we look forward to the future. It is also an act of defiance, for as even the more modern philosopher, Gilles Deleuze said, the act of procreation and creative construction is a defiance of death. Cicero is arguing much the same. How we respond to our duties and obligations is reflective of our belief in destiny, either that we control it or we will allow others to control it for us. If we control it, we can be said to be free. If we allow others to control it, we are slaves. And therefore, we should aim for freedom. We should aim to control our own destiny. Cicero suggests that our duties and obligations, beyond making meaning in our lives and leading to fulfillment, needs directions. For even what Augustine called the inward curve to the self, that becoming like a beast that Cicero talks about, is itself a reflection of duty, duty to the self, namely in the form of satisfying animalistic desires. However, wherever human action is directed, we are directing it to something. Cicero is calling us to a higher calling in our social animus and our desires and our appetites. If we were to only live for ourselves, this is not humane, and this is certainly not human living. We would be living like the beasts. Thus, Cicero is arguing that we need to persevere and endure in our obligations and duties to others. We must labor and labor piously. Thus we see Cicero's essential Stoicism. The desires we have need to be tamed and directed to higher things. This is the orientation of man's desires and energies to the commonwealth. For it is in the commonwealth that our desires can be put to good use controlled by our reason, thereby humanizing us, and we can discharge our primal desire of satisfaction through duties to other, others, leading to intimacy, love, and fellowship with our family, friends, neighbor, and ultimately our countrymen. Cicero is also writing throughout the work that the natural law is the social and moral animus, insofar that following the social animus makes men moral.
less like beasts, leads them to intimacy with one another, allows them to grow in understanding of the way of the world, and how following the social animus as a reflection of natural law leads to the duties that one must engage in to live a happy and ultimately fulfilled life. The good life is not possible without the social life, for if man lived alone, he would be miserable, unhappy, and if able to survive, only by living a bare life of foraging and struggling, much like the animals. But more likely, as a result of his being alone, he would die very quickly because of his isolation. Reason, which is the key reality of man's soul and what separates us apart from the animals, pushes us to the realization of patriotism, deontology, love and duties to family and friends. All are wrapped up in the social animus and must be brought together in union through social duty and obligations, whereby contentment is made possible in fulfilling one's duties and the society in which we are working and living in is peaceful, tranquil, and prosperous. And that is what actually gives us greater power, greater freedom, and greater leisure, not by being interested only in ourselves, but by laboring for the common good of others. Failure makes us angst-ridden, angst -ridden, feeling guilty and ashamed. This is not because you are not strong enough to overcome these feelings. It is because you have failed to live up to the natural law. And since the natural law is about happiness, Failure to live up to the natural law, naturally, pardon the pun, will leave you unhappy. And that is what Cicero is arguing for in Daophicius. He is saying that as we begin to reason about our life in the world and our human nature, we will realize that we have duties and obligations to ourselves, to our family, to our friends, to our community, and ultimately to our country. Cicero remains quintessential reading for us in the 21st century.